You know, when I think about coming to New York as a poet in the 70s, um, what mostly shocks me in retrospect is this sense of proximity. You know, that, that um, I remember standing at a party like Allen Ginsberg read with Robert Lowell at St. Mark's Church one night and Gregory Corso was in the art audience heckling. And Alan was like, Gregory yells out to Lowell when he's reading, you're talking to us like we're in school. And then Alan from the stage just went, shut up, Gregory. You know, and it was like, kind of, I mean, it was, I mean, we kind of knew we were in history, but it was kind of, but their relationships were right there, you know. And afterwards, there was a party at Alan's apartment, and we went, you know, because that's what you did. I mean, there's two things. One is that it, I, I was so shocked then, and maybe even now, that it was the most normal thing in the world to go to the party. That it wasn't, you know, there were probably 30 people in the room, you know what I mean? And, and it was like, and I was one of those people, and Robert Lowell was right there. And not that he was so, I mean, Alan was much more important to me than Robert Lowell, but I learned Robert Lowell in college. You know, and I knew, you know, he was just, you know, and it was just like, I was like, wow, I, I, you know, like it was like last year I was in Boston. I didn't know anybody. And this year I'm in New York and I'm in the room with Allen Ginsberg and Robert Lowell. And I was like, this is incredible. But the thing is, too, the thing that's so great is that what I didn't quite know then is that everybody in the room didn't go to that party. You know, there was a, there was a chemistry and part of it, it was just like, I, I was a good poet. You know, and, and, and I wasn't afraid, you know, like I didn't even know to be afraid, you know, I just knew to be excited. And it's like, it's interesting how excitement is, 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 is like kind of speed and entree itself. You know, it's sort of like when you're young and you're excited and you want something and it's not far, sometimes you just don't know any better than to go closer, you know? And I think that I, because I felt, you know, like I, I, I just was shooting my wad, I just felt like I, I, when I got to New York, I mean, I had tried, like, I left Boston, you know, after college, and I, you know, I was the generation, we went to Europe with our backpacks, and we hitchhiked around and, and stuff, and I did that for six months, and then I came back, I mean, anything could have happened, but nothing happened, and I came back to Boston, and then I was there, sad for a year, and then I decided San Francisco, and I went to San Francisco, and I took a train across Canada, and all these things happened, but in fact, it was awful, and I was sad, and I went back to Boston, and I was in Boston for a year, and I was like, what now, you know, and then made, made a series of decisions and, and got to New York. By the time I got to New York, I realized I was, it was over. I was stuck. Whatever this was, this was my life. I had made my decision. There was no going back to Boston. I wasn't there anymore. If I was, if this poetry thing was a good idea or it was a bad idea, it was the only idea I had. It was the only bus there was. I had taken it. I had gotten off. I had landed, you know, and so there was just this immense feeling of risk and also I had already taken the risk. So now it was easy, you know what I mean? Like, and it's like in retrospect, I think that's so crazy, you know, because any number of things could have happened then and other people could have had the exact same descriptions of what happened to them and a whole different outcome, you know, and, and, you know, and then too, just, you know, and I was in these workshops and I met these people and stuff. And so the doors opened for me. And part of that was, you know, like part of that is whatever, um, weird accidental chemistry there is in the universe and part of it was that I was good and I knew it and I was lucky enough to know it and that nothing got in the way of me knowing that and so it just sent me you know so it's like so New York New York so it was very and, and everything was easy in a certain way you know like I worked in a bar waitressing and the two guys who worked at the bar lived in the East Village and they were like I think I lived in Soho. I lived on the Upper West Side, and then I moved downtown. I lived in Soho, and then I wanted, the poets were all in the East Village, so I wanted to be in the East Village, and they were like, do you want an apartment? This an apartment in our building, and the rent was like $115 a month, and I was like, okay, and I got all my friends to, you know, it, it, you know there was just a fluidity that was, you know, part of the economy, and, and always the joke in New York was like, ah, you should have been here 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was cheap. You know, because then it was $50 a month, you know, and people were like, you wouldn't even think twice about moving, you know. Now we would think twice, you know. So it's just like there was just a, you know, you could live for a month without working, you know, because your bills were low enough and pay was 
low, but still you could, you know, so there was just a kind of a, so there was just an excitement and then, you know, like everybody, everybody in the neighborhood quickly seemed to be either a poet or a musician. It was just like, you know, one or two restaurants that were opened and they stayed open all night. And so there were all the people who had just played and there were all the people that, you know, and there were all the girls who, who were taking dance classes, were waitressing, you know, and, 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 you know, it was just this kind of amazing, so everything seemed, you know, like everybody seemed knowable. You know, everybody seemed, the famous didn't seem like that far. And, then, and you know, and I, th I think I, the thing I think I was, earlier today I was in the conversation about getting published. And it seemed like it was so hard and you had to, you know, send your poem to the New Yorker. And, you know, and people out there still think that's what you have to do. You have to send your poem to the New Yorker. You know, it's like New Yorker doesn't want your poem if they don't know who you are. But the kid next to me in the workshop had a little magazine and I didn't know that you could do that, that, that that it's like the, and I still see this. I just watched in New York for decades, people would come to New York, particularly from upper class backgrounds. This is, seemed to be very interesting to me. If you went to Yale and then you came to New York and you quickly, because you were somebody, you, you were, you know, you looked right, you, you know, you would quickly get a job, you know, that the rest of us would have to wait 10 years to get, you know, but you would just instantly be, be the arts editor for some new gay magazine and stuff. and you would be trying to figure out who the hot new artists were. And these people consistently never believed that the people they knew were the hot new artists. They had to believe that they had to be over there, far, far away. You know what I mean? Like had, they had to kind of use their power. I mean, there was, there was just, a, it's, it's such a, um, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is pretty clear. It's sort of like th this, this, this belief that's so tragic that art is far away and not right here. And it took me, off and on for the first 10 years I lived in New York, I learned repeatedly that the people near me, like there was a band on the fourth floor. I was like, oh, the band on the fourth floor. They're paying, playing at CBGB's, but they're probably not good. And I didn't pay attention to them for a while. It was Blondie. <laughs> you know, it was just like again and again and again. It was just like this guy in my workshop that was a poet kind of weird with a beard that I didn't see for 10 years. It was David Wanarovich. I mean, it was like everybody was like so close to everybody else. And, and, and you, once you got that, you realized you were, quote, on the scene, you know? And, and yet I watched um, privilege make some people unable to ever learn that. They didn't know that I was good, and she was good, and they were good, and the people you we were having sex with were good because they were like people you we were having sex with, you know? I mean, that kind of contempt for um, culture, you know? And it's sort of like you have to shed that to, to be part of it, and I think I, I was lucky enough to shed it very quickly and understand that, that this was the real thing.